Welcome to Dark Loops, Goodbye 2020. I'm Scott Jordan, cognitive psychologist, philosopher from Illinois State University, and joining me in tonight's podcast is a collection of amazing people who have participated in Dark Loops podcasts during 2020. So I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves and tell the audience a little something about who you are, what you dig, what you don't dig, and we will start with Procrastinella. Right, put me on the spot. <laughs> right, well, you're 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 right there on my screen. So, uh, hello. Well, I'm Procrastinella. I, mm -hmm. I am a Floridian. Please don't hold that against me. <laughs> um, I work for the University of Florida. Uh, huge, uh, huge, huge fan of Game of Thrones up until that wretched eighth season, um, and. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. It's always a good time when I get together with Scott and all the amazing people he brings into the fray. So that's pretty much it. It's always amazing when Procrastinella shows up. So thanks for being here. How about you, Leandra? Uh, so I'm Leandra Paris. Um, <laughs> I used to work with Scott at Illinois State University before moving to Virginia to be closer to family. So now I'm at William and Mary. I'm a school psychologist. Um, I do work in crisis and trauma and social equity in schools. Um, things that I dig, I was a huge Supernatural fan. So this year was Carry on. Um, a big goodbye, but I felt good about it. Like I feel, mm -hmm. I feel good about it. Uh, 15 years of my life are done. <laughs> you know, I'm sure they feel more differently about that. Things I don't dig, 2020. All right, let's go on to Byron. Hey, I'm um, Byron Craig. I'm a, a professor at Illinois State University. Also, I'm in the School of Communication. And let's see, things I dig. Cooking, um, which I've been doing quite a bit of in 2020. Yes, cooking and baking and a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, I love music. I just recently found my old iPod and I'm just having a blast with that because I used to teach cycling classes. So I am... Um, finding my own, my old um, workout list and um, reconstructing some classes and I hope to be teaching again in 2021. Mm. And uh, let's see, things I don't dig so much. Um, uh, I don't know if this, well, you know, well, I, I don't dig a lot of the politics of 2020, of course. Um, I don't dig that uh, the feds decided against the case for Tamir Rice today. So a lot, some things I don't dig, um, and most of those things are political, but we, we'll get into that later. Mm, very, very cool. I dig uh, all the cool. <laughs> Okay, I'm Stanford Carpenter. Um, to my best of my knowledge, I'm the only Stanford Carpenter on Facebook and Twitter. I am a cultural anthropologist coming to you out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, let's see, um, I love comics. I love archaeology. In fact, I was I was an archaeologist before I was in anthropology, and um, I love all you people. <laughs> so, I love you too, man. So yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I I love good conversation, and I'm just I'm I'm just looking 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 forward to a new year. Fantastic. All right, Will. How about you? Hi, I'm Will Gould. Uh, I'm very into politics, pop culture, and tech. Um, I've been lucky enough to work in a couple of them. Uh, and uh, it's been a wild year, and I'm looking forward to putting it behind us, especially the last nine months, uh, and just doing the countdown to the new administration. And uh, <laughs> definitely looking forward to that in 2020, 2021. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you so much. So, again, what I really wanted to do was just have a conversation or maybe a ritual about how to say goodbye to 2020 right just let it be gone because um it needs to be gone so i have a series of questions i'm going to throw them out there you guys feel free to answer them just jump in um so what are you looking forward most to leaving behind about 2020 anybody are we allowed administration to and their minions <laughs> Yeah, I have to admit. I mean, this these questions may be non-starters because they're so obvious that there, you know, there are some things that just we can't wait till they're gone. Yeah, um, I can well, never, never hear Trump's voice again. Like, I just, I just need to like, I all that, like, I just need it out. I'm not, I just, yeah. 
I mean, call me strange, call me, call me a bleeding heart, but you know, I, I look forward to not hearing stories about brown kids being locked up and dying in captivity and not being able to see their families again. I mean, you know, wow, that's, that's, that's my bar. I try to say something snarky and I can't even say something snarky to that. Absolutely. Well, that is part of the problem of 2020 is there's just so much shit. I mean, you know, you almost feel bad if you have a conversation about 2020 where you laugh or smile because, man, it's just so many directions you to go. You can go to find absolute crap. So um, anybody else want to chime in or you can chime 2020 taught me something really interesting, which is, which is that there is no answer to to the question, how low can you go? There is no and bottom. That's, that's unfortunate. I got, uh, now that you mentioned that, um, you know, what I do in my research is try to investigate, I'll call it the, the world of unconscious assumption that we constantly live in. And, you know, I remember uh, people interviewing Trump back in 2015 and he'll never win and all the time he was getting in the press and all these assumptions that ended up just being violated one after the other after the other for four years. Um, you're right. And it shows you how much we don't like to talk about how much we trust each other, but it shows you how much we kind of trust each other. I mean, these things that we're seeing happening in this administration are just not things we've seen happen in other administrations. And we just kind of grew to trust that it wouldn't. Well, and, 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 uh, yeah, and it, and it goes beyond the administration also, right? I, I think because of this, and it's not just because of this administration, you know, these are things that have been coming about for a long time, but this administration showed us just how corrupt um, you know, some people can be and how they can get away with this corruption. And I think that's the thing that has just really dampened my spirit all year, right? To see these things that people can, that, that have, they've been allowed to get away with. Um, and, and I was, I was raised thinking, you know, with, with the notion of trying to figure out, you know, my parents necessarily tell me this is right, this is wrong. They wanted us to figure this out for ourselves, right? And, you know, being the youngest of nine siblings, I pretty much got a good feel for the right way to treat people, right? Um, and, and I think that, I think this is, this year has really shown me just how nasty other people can be, but also how they can get away with that nastiness and that corruption. And I think that's the thing that bothers me the most. And our ignorance about letting people get away with these things, right? The, the, these excuses. For instance, the, um, the, the, the police officer in Columbus that, you know, there was an article today about him and his religious beliefs and he used those religious beliefs mm -hmm. to validate, um, you know, using uh, or being overly uh, violent in, poli in, in policing situations. And, and, and you know, I, I've told some of you, but my father was, was a sheriff in my hometown um and i just never saw policing like that like like mm. well, like some of, and i'm not saying all police but seeing these types of things happen but to see how people get away with it but the, the excuses of you know my my religious belief tells me that you have to use violence to stop someone i mean it's just i mean it's just really really <laughs> you don't have to use violence you have to use it against black and brown people right. Yes, that's the qualifier. Yeah. Well, I I couldn't even finish the article when I read because I'm like, surely this is clickbait. Mm -hmm. They don't have it right. And then I read like one paragraph, and I'm like, that, yeah. I, I I couldn't. I just can't. And yeah. yeah, to answer your question about 2020, I think this stuff has always been going on. It's just that thing that's leaving the White House he emboldened people were emboldened to you know be more open about it it's always been there hell i live in the south i mean it's always been there but now people i mean think about it before i'm sure it happened but we didn't hear about it as much 
someone feeling they have the right to stop somebody who's walking in the place where they live, show me that you live here. Prove that you live here. But they pick and choose where mm. they do that. Because trust me, there's parts of where I live here in Gainesville, you ain't going to roll up on nobody who looks like me and try that. You know, they, they, they just feel empowered, if that's the right word, to do that. And it, it's trying to wind the clock back to those good old mm. days. Mm. But, you know, they weren't good for us and a lot of other people. And uh, I think 2020 brought out the cynic in me. It, uh, it, it kind of made me a bit more cynical. If I've learned anything from 2020 on a personal note, there's some drama that's going on in my family with custody of my little um, three, now four-year-old nephew. nephew. Yeah. And, and it reminded me that 2020 has taught me not to take anything for granted. Don't just assume. You know, you, we've had rough years before, but this one, I think it's been so rough because of the callousness. I mean, I haven't it's watched- It's been building. Yeah, and I haven't watched the news in two weeks. I, I can't, I just can't deal all i hear is covid 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 before that it was had me on pins and needles because it was leading up to the election you know because you know i'm sitting there going i i didn't want to do what i did in 2016 because i was one of the people that said that crazy fool can't win and then i was sick as all get out the night of the election so i was on pins and needles you know leading up to the election after you know, even when Biden was ahead, I was like, this fool might pull, you know, something out of his hat. So I couldn't rest easy mm. until, you know, they had really called the election for Biden. You know, I, I felt a bit better. So, okay, now I can, I can't even tell you what's going on with, with the stimulus package now because it changes so much. But I do know that they're sitting there blocking, keeping people from, you know, yeah. funds that they would need. And I'm like, when did we become, or when did people let us become this country that doesn't care about those in need? You know, that's not who we are. That's not who we're supposed to be. But this current regime, if that's the right word, has made it acceptable for people to stand up and go, yeah, I don't want them to have that or, you know, build that wall, whatever. We put kids in cages. That's, mm. that's unacceptable. You know, yeah, but then again, hey, this is the country that said it was okay for people to own other people. So shouldn't yeah. we be surprised? You know, I end up having yeah. to tell myself that, you know, and like uh, you said, Stanford, you learned that, what did you say that uh, you that learned? There what, is no answer to the question of how low. How low we, yeah, I, I don't think there's a bottom. Uh, sadly, I don't think there's a bottom. I don't want to find out you know, just how low it goes, but it right. makes, this is why the aliens won't talk to us. Like I said, this is why they won't talk to us because of the way people, you know, are, are behaving. And I mean, and openly, so, yeah, let, openly so, behaving this way. Yeah. So Will, well, one thing, go ahead, go ahead. One thing that I think, I think happened is that um, 2020 was a reset. 2020 was a reset was was the call and, and, and it was and it was the and it was a reset that was born out of the culmination of everything that has happened since 2016. It was a reset in terms of um, of it, it was a reset in terms of of ethnic and race relations in this country. Um, and in particular, it was a it was a reset in terms of how um, in terms of how 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 all of the different groups um, you know you know black brown and all the and all the shades in between and outside see each other it was a reset because because a lot of things that had been talked about that had been joked about and kind of dismissed as semi conspiratorial were borne out to be true <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it was born out to be true in the form of in the form of all the video cameras that we now have in our hands in the form of cell phones, right? You know, we used to talk about we used to talk about um, about inequities in the in terms of the treatment of people of color by police, but 
but now it's it's we're seeing it right mm -hmm. we used to you know and and but i think that 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 subtle thing of the fact that we weren't seeing it allowed us to keep it as a debate that was abstract and within that abstraction what it allowed for is is it allowed for you know because I, I don't think I, I mean i mean trump trump was bold right but there are many there are many other people before him that led up to him who were much more subtle right but what it what it, what it means is that when you when you take out that ability to have that slippage right that well is it really happening you know we're not really seeing it it's one thing to it's one thing to talk about or yeah. or even you know i even think for me as a kid to recount stories of things that i experienced at the hands of police it's another thing, you know, and for me to tell you about it, it's another thing for you to see it on camera. It's another thing for, for, for like the news media to turn into literally a 24 hour snuff film. Yeah. In fact, and, and what's ironic about that is, is even the notion of a snuff film is somewhat of an urban myth, right? But right. now we've, now we've got it. Now, now we, now we've all had to sit down and watch it together, right? Now we've all had to, now we've all, all gotten to see the video of of a kid of a kid from suburban Illinois driving uh, driving up to Wisconsin and literally shooting somebody who was who who was protesting, right? You know, I mean, shooting somebody who's who who was attacking him with what a skateboard, right? So we see this, and now now we're caught in this moment where where it's not something left up to the imagination. Nope. And in the wake of that, we're voting. Yeah, and in the wake of that, like, 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 yes, there are people who are who are left of center, and some people who are right of center, who looked at the situation and were like, you know what, can't roll with that. This is so bad that I'm, going to, you know, the Lincoln Republic. Hmm. Yep. Bad, right. The mm -hmm. fact that we could have that statement of this is so bad that the fact that we can't answer the question, how low can you go? Right. And then in the wake of all of that, a record number of people voted to maintain that status quo. That yeah. is, that is tectonic because yeah. what it does is it says it is that, is that, you know, you know, I, I keep thinking of the, of the thing. It's, it, it's not that, it's not that, that voting for Trump may, makes you a racist. It's that voting for Trump, it literally says to you that racism isn't a deal breaker, right? Right, And and so you follow that through with racism not being a deal breaker. Also classism not being a deal breaker, ethnocentrism Sexism. not being a deal breaker. And then you double down and you see the numbers for, the, for that vote. I don't think that this country is gonna be the same for a very long time because Things have been so laid out in such stark terms <laughs> that that even in even in victory, I think that the I think that the left has been irrevocably altered. I live in a household where where we are we are engaged in discussions where I'm very anti-gun, and the other person, one of the other people in my household, is like, I need to feel safe, and I it, and there's no and, and you can't argue that. You can't argue that when you can look out and see that, right? right. Um, and it's not that it's not that that I think that like there's that, that oh we're looking at riding in the streets, et cetera, et cetera. But what we what we've done is we have Ill, we have created a situation where where there have been violation of norms that have been tolerated, and there are violations of norms that have so brutally affected specific groups. That I don't know how you truly come back from that in a generation. So before we go any further, we have to uh, we have to say hi to Sister Kay who joined us. Uh, please unmute your mic and uh, introduce yourself to the audience and let us know a little bit about maybe what you dig and what you don't dig. Oh wow, that could take forever <laughs> no you just just am, one or two for each category <laughs> okay i am sister k um of the sister speak 
podcast network and we talk about TV shows and movies from a sister's point of view. And we've been podcasting for 13 years, I think now. And um, what I dig and what I don't dig, ooh, about 2020. <laughs> Whatever. Is that what we're talking Believe about? Me. I don't think whatever. anybody's digging 2020, so. <laughs> I mean, it's had a lot of bad things, but I feel like it's also opened doors of opportunity this year. Mm -hmm. Even though we have all of the negative connotations to the year and the things that have happened to our world, but it's also opened up our eyes, I think, on a personal level of what's really important in life that we kind of forget because we're so busy in the rat race of trying to, at least in my opinion, of all the things we're trying to do and accomplish and make sure that we're not losing our eye on the prize, but at the end of the day, the prize isn't really what matters anyway. It's it's our personal connections with people and and our loved ones and who we enjoy spending our time with because life is so short, as mm. we see in this in this year specifically. Mm. So I had some positives and negatives to this year. So Very I'm not cool. discounting everything with the year. Excellent. So um, the first question was, what are you most looking forward leaving behind in 2020? Now, we've oh. covered a big chunk of that. And I do want to get to coping strategies that you all may have used in 2020. But before I go to that, I do want to, because um, I know Will hasn't really had a chance to talk about what you'd like to leave behind, if you'd like to do that now. Well, I just wanted to make a sort of a, a comment earlier. Sure. Two of the things that were really distressing in life and that was also confidence and, mm. and fact-based reality. Oof. Like diving into these just BS things. And that was also set up, you know, by four plus years of the current head of the government saying, you can do these things, giving cover to white supremacists, nationalists. And it just builds over, it builds over time. And they're all, all come out of the woodwork and people yeah. will tap attach on to whatever they can to basically go on that. And the fact that people can look at facts and just say, I want alternative facts that will <laughs> fit my personal narrative beyond the way the reality is, is just brutal. Well, I got to tell you, time for go that. Ahead, go like ahead, you say, go ahead. it may take more than a generation to bring it back. But, you know, I think that was one of the worst and most damaging sort of things because that sets a whole system up. And, and you can just disregard stuff. Uh, I'm never going to see that video because I'm never going to watch it. My, the channel I watch won't show it, and I'll watch some conspiracy theory put out by QAnon or somebody else, and that's my reality. Right. So that, so that, that to me was like one of the most depressing things in the light of the pandemic in addition to everything else. No, I totally agree. Um, so what I'm about to say may make it sound like I'm cynical, but it's not. I've never really considered the things that come out of people's mouths, things like ideas and that sort of thing, to really be much beyond identity work. Uh, so I've, how do I say this? I haven't invested in rationalism the way a lot of Americans do. That's not cynical. I, I look when I look at someone and try to figure out who they are, what I look at is what are their words and their actions keeping the same in the world for them? That's what they mean. That's what they are. So for me, as you said, uh, um, um, this alternative reality thing, I think this is for me, it's also becoming clear that most people are just going with whatever ideas are being floated around that help them sustain their identity. I, I the, the, the rational reliance on what we call facts is it's there and it matters to some, but I've never really felt, I've never had a universal assumption that it, it matters to everybody. Um, so for me, hopefully what this does is reveal the identity-based nature of all language. We're keeping something stable about ourselves by the thoughts we perpetuate and believe and then maybe we can i think become a bit more pragmatic about what we expect people to do um so let's go to the next question here what coping strategies have you developed to deal with all these things we've talked about and there's a progression to these questions what's the shit we've been in how have you dealt with it 
And what are the good things you're looking forward to in 2021? So anyone, coping strategies. I well. streamed. <laughs> <laughs> Rock on, brother man. <laughs> Green fin. It's an organic California wine available at Trader Joe's for $4.49. You go, man. Okay, any non-alcoholic coping mechanisms? <laughs> Well, I, I, oh. Oh, go ahead, Byron. Hey, Sister Kay, anyway, Hi. too. Hey there. Good to see you. I, mm -hmm. I um, you know, I actually, in April, I purchased a, an, an indoor bike um, for cycling. Because uh, I said earlier, I, used, I, I taught cycling before I moved to Bloomington, Illinois. And that really has been something that I, when I get to my lowest, darkest moments, I can hop on the bike. I, I love, absolutely love music, you know, so I, I'll do a whole workout with a whole remix of Whitney Houston songs. And it just yeah. kind of helps me get away from things. But, you know, that, that, that's really, that has been my go-to. But I found in the last couple of months, um, and maybe it's because I've had some deadlines, that the writing and research has really kind of, kind of helped me get away mm. from because I, I'll be honest, when all this, when the when co when the pandemic first started, uh, I was watching news twenty four seven. I would literally sometimes stay up at night just because I didn't want to miss anything. I, right. I just wanted to be totally aware of it all the time. And, and some of you know my my best my best friends, uh, um, the executive medical director for the Will County Health Department in, in Illinois, and so she would call me every night and tell me things on their calls that the general public didn't basically know about. Mm. And so and, and that got, it was really starting to get to me. And, you know, also when, when, when the, when, you know, when more and more black folk kept getting killed by oh, the God. police and stuff, I really um, didn't, I wouldn't go outside. Um, I basically just kind of um, locked my, lock myself away. I, I just didn't feel comfortable going out. I didn't right. want to be around people. Um, and so I had to do something to, to keep myself moving and, you know, getting the bike um, was probably a lifesaver for me. Um, even my poor partner, Steve, I wouldn't even let him come to Bloomington. I just didn't want anyone coming into my, into my apartment. Um, I, I was really, I, I got really worked up about it because I, you know, my age, my health, I just, you know, and, and, you know, also my nephew had a really, he was in the hospital on a ventilator for two months. Oh my COVID. God. Um, and very, very healthy kid. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, I knew, I said, well, my fat ass will die from this, mm -hmm. right? So I, I wouldn't, I just said, no, I, you know, I, no one can come in. No one go out. My neighbors would sometimes see me and say, want me to help with your groceries? And I like, no, I got this. You, I'll take two trips to the car. I just didn't mm -hmm. want to be around anyone. So you know, getting the bike kind of helped me, you know, I'm, I'm in Bloomington, Indiana right now. Um, and even that was just uh, a real big thing for me. So when Steve was coming to pick me up, I got on the bike. I was like, just ride your bike. You'll be okay. You can get in the car. He is quarantined because he taught face to face this semester past. Oh my God. Yeah. So, you know, I, I we went through the whole thing. I said, you've got to quarantine. You need to get tested, everything before, you know, you can even come up here. So, yeah, I, I've been really kind of, I was really on edge about the whole thing and, you know, you know, so. So was I. Yeah, that, that bike really helped me. And, you know, back in the day, I, I just don't drink now um, for a number of reasons, but uh, I'm sure if I did, I would be going, running out and getting some of that wine mm -hmm. <laughs> that you just talked about, Stan. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's the thing that has, that's, I think that's the thing that has helped me, that in, in my writing and um, getting these deadlines and stuff, so. That's fantastic. Yeah. Who else? And, and, and these podcasts. I mean, the, these, these, not packets, but whatever these are, these recordings have really helped me a lot. You know, I, I listen to the knowledge you all drop all mm -hmm. the time, and this is something I've never done. This is new to me. And this really has, I, I think, I jump on these because it really has helped me to have a, con a human connection besides my students uh, and to just hear the, you know, the brilliance that comes from these conversations. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really helped a lot also. So that's been my coping. So just make sure we all know that you're adding to that brilliance, brother man, right? I mean, I've Definitely. loved podcasting with you and um, 
I'll one quick coping mechanism of mine, which you've mentioned, and I'll just turn it over to someone else. But these podcasts have completely mattered, uh, particularly doing Lovecraft Country in the middle of all this um, was really, really, really. And the word's not helpful. The word is more. Uh, I was in it. We we're living in this Lovecraft stories, telling a story about this. I'm talking about this with people who get it. Um, it was a, a, it was an extremely intense experience, and and it, and, it, and I, I learned so much. So I very much appreciate uh, all of that. Who else? Coping mechanisms. Wait, you know what? All, all jokes aside, um, you know, I think for me the one the one thing that's emerged as the most interesting thing is, as I call it, chasing the sunrise. Is um, so I mean I I live in Bronzeville, which is a historically black neighborhood in Chicago. Um, and it does bump up against the lakefront. And so I'm about, a, I'm about a half mile from the lakefront. And in Chicago, we have a, we have a lakefront bike trail where you can, where they, they actually, it's actually two parallel trails, one for running and, and walking, the other one for riding, for biking. And so I've, all, I've biked there for quite some time. And that, that for a while was my, was, was, was my therapy. And, and so was running was my therapy as well. Um, but but something something else happened during the pandemic um, when my partner relocated here is that um, there are a couple of times where, where like the anxiety was such that we weren't sleeping and and you know you could wake up in the morning and the sun you know before the sun comes up and you could drive in Chicago and Chicago was a ghost town mm. just empty. And you could drive whatever speed you wanted, you could drive wherever you wanted because no, everything was on lockdown. And, and so, so since we weren't sleeping, we started just driving and we would drive and we would literally watch the sunrise and we watch the, the sun reflect against the, um, against the skyscrapers as we drove up and down Lakeshore Drive. And then um, eventually my partner also got a bike and and um, and then what was started happening is 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 I kept waking up really really early, and so I started you know I, I would be riding and I'd be watch, literally watching the sunrise. And there's something about watching the sunrise. It's this moment where there is where, where hope is infinite. You know we haven't seen what the day's going to look like, let right. alone what it's going to bring. And and so I started actually like every morning when I would ride, I would take a picture. And so, and I post them on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, that's the same is like now that I'm, you know, I, I had taken actually a couple of years off from running due to injuries and I've been coming back and, and interspicing running with it and with the biking. And it's the same thing. I actually, like this morning, um, I, you know, when I ran, I, I got to the top of the bridge, took a picture of the sunrise and, and that, that idea you know, because even when I when I stepped out this morning, I, I stepped out and I looked I looked out towards I looked out towards the east, and it was like the dark of night and, and just this rose color interrupting it, and I knew that that meant that the sun was coming, mm -hmm. and so so I just I kind of altered my workout to run to a spot where I could take a picture, you know, but it really the taking of the picture was just was just the thing that motivated me to get to the spot where I could see this moment of like, of, of infinite hope and infinite possibility, right? Um, and so for me, that's actually been, been, been the, the ultimate like, like moment for coping. And, and it, it's the fact that you can take, you know, that, that depending on how early I wake up, I'm at a different spot. Like there's my favorite statue, there's over my Navy pier, there's past Navy pier where, We've been having trouble with the water coming up onto the onto the path, and I'll, I'll literally ride and just get soaked. And but it doesn't matter because I got that picture, right? Um, so so yeah. As far as coping mechanisms, um, I like to joke about the green fin, which I love, but it's really about chasing sunrise. It's fantastic. I often told my kids one of the hardest things to do is to let every day be a new one, right? Um, and you know when you wake up and the world's not like it's been. You know, you just you need a good night's sleep. But in this situation, using the world to help market for you, right? To help you hope, it's fantastic. Absolutely. Who else? Coping mechanisms. 
for me, exercise and just trying to get something that's going for long walks with wife and the dog and sometimes the kids if we can swing it mm. and uh, podcasting whether i'm listening to any number of podcasts and podcasting especially with procrasty scott sister k and uh you know i do a politics one sometimes and those are always interesting too excellent how about you procrastinella in a different way so exactly um excuse me um, for me, um, I kind of rediscovered, uh, I guess, the love of cooking. Uh, I work in uh, intellectual property. So when COVID hit, we had to work, for home, work from home for about three months. So from March until June, I had to adjust to working from home. And I sorely missed having a dual monitor going from that to a laptop. <laughs> but one of the neat things about working from home that I came to uh, just to, uh, I loved being able to literally roll out of bed five minutes before it was time to be to work because- Love that commute. <laughs> yep, you know, does that. I never did the Zoom meetings in my pajamas or anything, but um, I had a lot of free time when I wasn't busy, you know, doing contracts or anything. So I did a lot of baking, uh, blueberry muffins, lemon loaves, and did it from scratch. And I even went old school and did it by hand, you know, instead of using a mixer. So that was quite therapeutic and kind of also built up my arms, you know, having to stir the batter. So baking helped. Um, it was weird. Whereas I used to watch everything on TV in terms of news, like I was an MSNBC junkie, but I kind of tapered that off because I got tired of, like I said, the election coverage and, you know, stuff leading up to November because November was stressful enough. Mm. So um, streaming, um, I got the fire stick so I could watch Hamilton, which ironically, I, I get the fire stick and it took me three months to finally I watched everything but Disney Plus, but I finally did watch Hamilton and it was everything people said it would be. I loved it. Uh, downloaded the soundtrack. Uh, my favorite song from that entire amazing soundtrack is the one uh, he's dealing with the impossible. I forgot it. Um, they sing it when uh, Hamilton's son, his son dies. I love that one. So mm. I did streaming. And what helped mm. me cope actually was comedy. I said, you know what, I, I've got to step away from all this constant, constant drumming of doom and gloom. So I went to the opposite spectrum. I said, you know, I need to laugh. I need comedy. So I binged Frasier all 11 seasons. You know, I was posting about it, you know, <laughs> and I didn't realize each season was like 21 episodes long. So it took me a minute. I think I started in late July. I finally finished all of Frasier in November and it was great. I mean, I would come home because by June we were back to working in the office. So, you know, I would come home and I'd watch maybe three, four, maybe even five episodes, but I was laughing because I, I think I can honestly say every single episode of that show got a laugh out of me. Not always, you know, as hearty. I mean, there were some, that you know gosh i mean they had me in tears i was laughing so hard but i could laugh and that's laughter is what got me through so i binged all of frazier and then just recently for some reason i i wanted to watch scandal uh mostly i think for joe morton because he was amazing as papa pope in that and i did dig olivia pope she had a great you know wardrobe and stuff but that was like a bag of lays potato chips I did seven <laughs> seasons in like nine days. Oh, and okay. yeah, and yeah, I mean, well, you know, there was there was there was family drama going on. So again, that was a distraction. Mm -hmm. But I remember one day I said, Wow, I've already watched I was on season three of this show before I knew it, but it was a distraction. So now I'm going back to the comedy angle. So to to escape the constant, you know, constant onslaught of COVID coverage. So I'm, I'm doing the old shows. I'm going back. So I'm watching Psych right now. So oh. I'm eventually going to get back into watch Lovecraft Country. You know, I just, I need a little more uh, levity to cleanse my palate because I know Lovecraft Country is heavy. And when we 
I think when you wanted to do the Watchmen uh, thing, remember I told you, I said, ooh, I don't know if I can dive back into Watchmen right now because I think, I don't know if George Floyd had already right. happened, but there was just so much heavy stuff going on and Watchmen is a, yeah. you know, it's a great, but it's a heavy watch. And I'm like, I don't know if my soul can take that right now. So I'm all about levity. You know, I escape through comedy, through streaming, uh, through music. Like, you know, Hamilton was amazing. You know, I, I was I was humming and singing the soundtrack. So uh, escapism for me Absolutely. right about now, because uh, it the stuff is, like I said, I haven't watched the news really in almost two weeks because it's the same thing over and over and over. I am looking forward to the inauguration though. I have mm -hmm. that entire week off. So yeah, <laughs> that's how I'm celebrating. You know, I have the 20th off and I say, you know what? Because it's a Wednesday, I'm like, let's take that Thursday and Friday off too. And then we were already closed for Martin Luther King Day Monday. So I'm like, I think I need that Tuesday too. <laughs> and then the Thursday before I took that off, I'm like, yeah, I'm getting my hair done that day. So yeah. You know, so I got me a nice long stretch of time coming up for the inauguration. I'm excited, curious to see what it's going to be like, because mm -hmm. this will be, you know, you know, what inauguration in the time of COVID. So is yeah. it going to be outside or is it going to be coming to us from, you know, a hall? I hope not, but it doesn't matter because he won't be there. You know, <laughs> we, we don't have a second term of him. So. I don't care. They could be in the middle of a cow pasture inaugurating Biden. I don't care because Trump is not in there anymore. And if he throws a tantrum, I hope they escort him out. You know, I hope he fades into oblivion. I'm, a, I'm afraid he won't. He's from Mar-a-Lago. Uh, or unless he decides to leave the country, you know, hey, that, that would be great. But hopefully the, you know, New York, they'll come after him, you know, what after, but ugh. He's gone. So that's the me. That was the best Christmas present. That's the best thing go. about 2020 that Trump did not get reelected. It was ooh, fantastic. I was worried how, about that one. How about you, Leandra? Coping mechanisms. Um, therapy. Like <laughs> I think a psychologist in particular, like we are the last people to like go get therapy. Like we're constantly mm. like, oh, self-care. But like I was already in therapy before this happened and was fortunate enough to be able to keep that up. And I think just, I can't, like, I think it kind of like re instated my belief in my own field and like what I do. Um, and reminded me that like we, you know, doctors should go to doctors, therapists yeah. should go see therapists. Um, and so what I'm about to say for my coping actually comes from that experience. But um, one of the things that 2020 forced me to do was pick priorities. Um, my son went into kindergarten virtually. So I was what they called a buddy teacher. So about four hours a day was my t taking my son to school virtually and doing everything with him. Um, we had a, an infant when the pandemic started and she was still on formula and all of that. And now she's a toddler eating grown up food and walking and climbing and I, like, I just have a whole different being. <laughs> like, just, you know, grew up. And so managing that and, and unfortunately my husband was working 60 hours a week. So getting him down to 40 hours a week was like a big sacrifice, but he's still working 40 hours a week. So it really forced me to think about where I spend my time and how I use that time because I, mm. I had maybe 15 hours a week to get work done um, uninterrupted. And so um, I started listening more to like what my soul tells me. So when I go to work, the things that I leave and think, God, I want to do that again. That makes me feel really good. I keep doing that. And the things that I'm like, thank God that's over. I stopped doing, I turned off my review notifications. I focus solely on the anti-racist collaborative that we're building. I focus solely on working with students. I just started saying no. Um, yes. and screen time. Like I stopped a lot of that I kind of went back to I'm from Appalachia so like I didn't grow up with the internet I was the only millennial <laughs> that I know who didn't get internet until she went to college um and so getting back to kind of what Procrastinella was saying you know when we ran out of bread here in Virginia I went back to making bread and doing everything from scratch and um I picked up sewing again my mother-in-law was very helpful in reminding me that what sewing can be like. So I've made all Christmas presents. I went super white girl and started making candles out of wine bottles um, <laughs> and getting into, you know, using my hands and getting more in touch with my body. I think too, like what Byron was saying, like 
listening to what my head and my heart's telling me as well as my body and, and what feels good. And, um, so I think the biggest coping was just looking at where my passion is, what actually feels good saying no. Yeah. I don't know why that's so hard, but just saying no. And unfortunately it meant I also had to say no to podcasts, like the Watchmen podcast. Like I remember having, I just couldn't do it. Like the day of, I was just too stressed out and it hurts to say no, but recognizing that if I don't learn that skill in 2020, when else am I going to learn it? Um, so I think that's my big coping thing. Well said. To myself, prioritizing um, and being in the moment. And sewing, y'all sewing. Who knew? <laughs> you could like get what you want if you just do it yourself. Amazing. Amazing. How about you, Sister Kay? Oh, wow. So when the pandemic started, I, I think the biggest problem I had was worry for everybody else more than myself because I'm good with being at home. I worked from home before. Um, the current job that I had where they didn't really like you to work at home and they had to change their whole dynamic of our work. So we were at work extremely busy. So I really didn't have a lot of time to focus on watching the news and seeing everything that was going on because we were so busy working even in the evenings, extra hours. So it wasn't probably until about June that that eased up a little bit and I could kind of breathe a little. And then of course, all the podcasts and things that we do with our community. But um, I started about a month or two before the pandemic started trying to teach myself how to um, crochet. So one thing that I've been doing to cope is I have crocheted and I have a, now an obsession with buying yarn. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know where this is coming from, but it has to be related to the pandemic. <laughs> so I have an obsession with yarn and, and, and looking at patterns. So I would spend hours and hours like, oh, let me do that. Oh, and I have to get this specific yarn that they're using in the video or in the tutorial or whatever. And I would hunt for the yarn and just that took my mind away. Yeah. I'm kind of more of a um, uh, distract myself, don't think about serious things type of person anyway. And I think the pandemic kind of just exasperated that more to where I will go to extremes to not watch the news and to not have to think about things I don't want to think about. But it's kind of forced you to because it's everywhere. You can't escape it. So for me, it's kind of forced me to look at things that I normally would not want to because they're just depressing to me or they make me sad or for whatever reason, I just don't want to deal with it. But I've, I've been trying to not go my normal route because it's just in my face and having to deal with things and kind of acknowledge things that I have been doing, doing in my life that I didn't necessarily like, start focusing on the things that I love and what really matters. And it's not always attaining that extra dollar or getting that extra promotion or doing whatever it was I was trying to do to further my career, but to actually make more connections, which I think we've been doing, I've been doing for a while, but it's just. I don't know, just made me appreciate it a little bit more. So my coping has been avoidance, which is not always good. I don't drink a lot, so I couldn't do the drinking thing. <laughs> but I think honestly, it's what you, uh, Zombie Sky, Scotty and Byron have mentioned about podcasting. We, I mean, we've always podcasted. And I've always felt just a strong connection to the community that we've built. But for this year, it really hit home a little bit closer that these are the connections that matter. This is what I want to continue cultivating in my life is, is these connections. And it's not always going to be a physical one. And no, we're so lucky, if we can say lucky in this context, that we are in this time that we're in, that we have the tools to still connect with people without having to be physically next to someone. You're in Illinois, I'm in Texas. Someone else is in England, I'm in the US. I mean, we can still connect and we can mm -hmm. still build um, relationships with people and we don't have to do it physically. So that's helped me a lot. I'm still no, talking to people every day, even though I'm at, you know, I'm working at home. I'm still working at home and we're probably gonna be working at home until at least for now until April. And then they're gonna look at it again then. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I just kind of went into this little rut of never leaving the house. I got all my groceries delivered, get them in the house, wipe them all down. Just kind of paranoid um, yeah. oh my God. mindset that you get into. And I'm still kind of that way because I still don't want to. 
compromise any of my family that I'm yeah. around or myself. Because like Byron said, I'm fluffy. And if, if they were talking about fluffy people get it worse, I would definitely get it. <laughs> mm. So I was trying to make sure that I stay away from that. But I think um, the crochet, the connection with people and the crafty, you know us, we get that TV going. Yeah, we do. We can escape anything, really. There you go. So I was watching everything that I could, podcasting like crazy. Um, we started creating other content and we were just working, just working, keeping myself busy, doing other yeah. things, which I know is not always the healthiest thing to do, but it's helped me a lot. Be able to no. kind of put things in perspective and no, it's fantastic. Not get too far into my head and. Well, that's the thing is scared. to you know keep moving, right? Try to just keep moving because it's very easy not to. Um, Unfortunately, I did not get which I wish I would have gotten this coping mechanism, which is exercise. I didn't I either. Need to walk around the block to save my life. I'm like, why? It's a beautiful day. I need some air. I'll go take the trash out and then I come back in and shut my door. But I was not walking around that block. So I wish I would have gotten that coping. <laughs> yeah, I fell into that same thing. Um, <clears throat> I could have gone out every morning and walked. You know, I got a nice couple block area where I can walk around it twice and I've done a mile. Um, and I didn't. I mean, it's like, dude, why didn't you, right? Well, because I get up, I try to be at my desk at about eight because I'm, I'm in administration at the university. So there are just always something that comes up and you've got to deal with. And uh, the weird thing that happened was I just never stopped working until seven. But that doesn't mean I was doing work all day. It just meant, okay, well, then I go to YouTube and I click on this. And, you know, the, the day was more amorphous than it was when I would go into work and then be there. And so, um, <clears throat> so it was eight to seven most every day, but it wasn't like I was doing work work all that time mm -hmm. um working on the podcast i gotta admit i i'm I crazy lost my mind in that stuff back in uh back and i want to say uh in, in late summer early fall uh like for the sears of artem podcast i turned it into a 70s uh tv show and it's got an audio visual 30 second intro that took me probably 40 hours to make but there wasn't no way in hell. There's no way in hell I wasn't going to make it. Once it became clear that I could, that's just kind of how I do. Like a dog, you just grab it and don't let go. Yeah. Um, and and that just keeps you moving. And as you said, it keeps you out of the other space. Then there's another habit I fell into. My wife and I kind of fell into it. So I watch Morning Joe every morning. You know, I get up. It starts at 5 a.m. Central Time. I listen to it. They so do a, I, They do a podcast and you get about half the show. Yeah, so what I do is I don't start watching it till an hour, an hour and a half after it started so I can go through commercials because I hate commercials. And I can get through all the content I don't care for, you know. But then I started, my wife and I started watching Brian Williams because he comes on around here, I think, at 11 o'clock at night. Is that right? Or does he come on? No, he comes on here at 10. He comes 11. on at 11 on the East Coast. Yeah, it's called the 11th hour, but it starts at 10 here. Yeah. yeah. Because that's MSNBC doesn't adjust the way the broadcast right. system do. And I hadn't ever really watched him, but when I when he was counting down every day of the Trump administration and then counting down the number of days left, I just fell in love with that whole end yeah. the day process with that little thing by him. And then the, the talking heads came on and it was okay, but it's always the same kind of COVID stuff or Trump stuff. So eventually, you know, we'll be sitting there and say, hey, baby, you want Brian? And she goes, sure. And we'll watch the first 10 minutes and then go with bed or whatever, just to get that closing the day ritual uh, in there. But uh, so that was, I don't know that I coped as well as I could have. I could have been a little, I'll be honest, I could have taken a little more. I guess what we would call contemplative time, but for me, contemplative time is creating. So, you know, if I'm if I'm making podcasts or such, that's that's my relaxing. Um, so, so the next question I have and um, is, um, what are some good things that are that happened during 2020? For me, the best thing about 2020 is also the worst thing about 2020. It's lockdown. Mm. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, um, you know, 
this this whole like turning inward has been has been really interesting um in that um you know my partner ended up relocating here at the beginning and you know the assumption was which is going to be for a couple of weeks nine months later um you know i i have the pleasure of of um of being a part of raising a beautiful afro asian daughter and um, she spends time at my place and, and at her mother's place. And um, she and I were in the car earlier today and we were just talking about like what, what all of this means. And the thing that was really interesting was, you know, she's been doing homeschooling. And, and the nice thing about where we are is that um, we're blessed to be in a space where, you know, I have an office with the door that closes. <laughs> um, my partner has an office with a door that closes. And my daughter has a bedroom that has multiple ethernet ports because that's how we built the house with a door that closes, right? <laughs> and so we all get to like do our stuff. Um, and, but we come out and we meet in the kitchen. And if we're watching TV together, it's because we want to because there's more TVs than there are people in this house. And, and so, so, so Kira and I were talking about it and we just had this realization that that as much as being in lockdown sucked in terms of taking away, you know, elements of our freshman year of high school, you know, we've also really, you know, we've also just in, been able to enjoy the fact that that like we're fortunate. We live in a space where we have the space that we need and we have the space to come together and we forge different types of relationships. Um, you know, it's funny, it's funny and not funny that we kind of laugh at these stories about families where they're like, oh my God, I have to deal with my kids. And we're just kind of like, well, you raised a little monster and you enjoyed sending that little monster off to a school where somebody else would be paid to deal with the monstrousness that you created. And now you got to deal with it in your lap. Sorry, but that's not what we, that's not our experience. We get to right. laugh at that. And the thing is that, that, that we both realized in that moment when we were driving that, you know, there are some things about this we're going to miss. And part of it is mm. that we actually really enjoy being together. And yep. that, that is the, you know, that, that, that even as, as afraid as at times we've been of what's going on outside with the pandemic, with, you know, the looting and, you know, and the civil unrest was literally in our backyard. You know, um, as scary as that was, it was like this this moment for us all to come together and to realize just what we love about each other. That that's been that's been the the, the great thing that's come out of twenty twenty for me. I have to second that. Um, my daughter, my both of my daughters. My oldest is 22, she's married. Her husband was in the Marines and got out of the Marines in March. And she drove to South Carolina, brought him back here and they lived with us. And um, like you Stanford, we had a space where my, we could be alone, I, I can be alone so that you can all get your private space. And we would find that about two or three times a day, we'd all just get together kind of spontaneously. It wasn't a schedule. We didn't eat together because they weren't going to eat with me, but um, um, but we just had these times that um, th that that were good, right? And uh, now they're both uh, gone. My oldest got a job as a social worker and is kicking butt and has her own place, and uh, the other one got an internship down in Carbondale and she's living her life so. Um, you miss that to the point where I call them every night until they tell me not to, right? And they'll tell me not to at some point. But uh, um, that was good. Yeah, yeah. Someone else. I agree with both of you. It's the reconnection for me. I mean, the pandemic has caused us all to think about what's really important. Like I said earlier, but it's really made me have to, I mean, we all know we're gonna die someday. We don't really think about it. You avoid it. And this has made you really realize, okay, it could be tomorrow. Right. It could be mm -hmm. really horrible. And I could be all alone with the ventilator and with this huh. illness. And it just makes you, it just brings it home. So it really makes you appreciate 
the things that you don't really sit and appreciate until unfortunately someone maybe in your family passes away or something happens like what's happened this year to make you really sit in it like you said and think about what are we doing with our life i'm so busy running here and running there and doing this yeah. and doing that i'm not appreciating the time well i mean i'm kind of different my daughter's grown so i've gone through this before when she graduated high school and went to college that i was like what do i do my whole life is my daughter and now i'm sitting here by myself like boo -boo the fool. what am i gonna do with my right. life my life has been her so it's kind of so it kind of brought that back a little bit like, what am I going to do now that we are in this new world that no one has ever experienced before? What are we going to do? I can't sit here crying in my bedroom every day. I can't mm. think about that all the time. I can't worry about it. I have to appreciate the time that I have, even if it's a day or a minute or whatever, because we don't know when our time is going to come. So it's, for me, it's been that connection with not just my family, but also people that I care about. The family that we've created with Sister Speak, the family that I have here physically with me. And I think it's made all of those connections even richer where I just don't say bye, see you tomorrow. I say mm. bye, I love you. Mm. And I'm and I'm thinking about that when I'm calling my friends and I'm just like, what's going on? How are you doing? It's not just a fleeting little conversation. I'm really trying to make those connections deeper. So for me, it's been the connection and the clarity in what I really find important in my life and to slow down and quit running from here to there and doing mm. 50,000 things, mm -hmm. slow down and enjoy things that I enjoy and enjoy the people that I have in my life and let them know how much I care about them now and not wait until something tragic happens to where I think about it and say, I should have told them that. No, so that I... for me, that's what it's been. Fantastic. I like the idea of letting them know I'm such a sentimentalist. I've been doing that forever. Yeah. <laughs> People say, you don't have to say it every time. And I said, yes, I do. And I'll just take the hit. Uh, and, but you say it to people that you normally maybe wouldn't have said it to before. At least for me, I do. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've noticed myself yeah. with a friend of mine, actually all my friends, I'll say, I love you before I get off the phone. Yep. Or I'll, I'll just call them up, say, Hey, I haven't talked to you or, Though it will text and I'll say, wait a minute, let's just jump on the phone because I just need to hear your voice and I need to connect in that way. Or let's get on Zoom so right. I can see your face. I haven't seen you in five months. Yeah. Well, normally we would see each other every couple of weeks. So right. that's what I find myself doing. And it feels me, it makes me feel more love than I thought or makes me, I don't know if you ever get these swellings of love at weird moments where you just feel it in your heart and your soul and you just want to tell everybody that you care about you love them i feel mm -hmm. that now every time i'm with them mm -hmm. or when i'm talking to them mm -hmm. and before it was like in every once in a while i just feel this in various moments random moments like a month here or two years there but now i feel it every time that i'm mm -hmm. with them so it's i don't know it's a weird thing oh, to explain but that's just my well, stupid thank, no. old sentimental but that cries at commercials now. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Who else? I Best thing actually, about 2020. I feel awful because you guys are talking about like all the connection. And I think the best thing for me was cutting people out. Um, I definitely agree that I am more connected to the people that I am connected to. Um, but I've learned this year has really shown people for who they are um and where i've been putting my energy and who like this gave a lot of people a good opportunity to either be there or to not and, and it taught me a lot about who i was letting in my life and letting take up my energy um that i shouldn't have been and so i agree i, I definitely i get that whole swelling of love and i feel it for people and i, I feel like i i've connected more quality with certain people but only because i have cut out and said goodbye to others because who to let in who to keep out right, right we, like, we do it all the time and unfortunately when we talk about empathy we act as if empathy means letting everybody in and um that's just that's just dangerous to yourself well you know paradise isn't just about who's in it's about who's out 
Right. And having the strength to say, you know what, like, I know you're a family member, but we are fundamentally not. Right. And when I say keep out, you know, who's, who's toxic for you? Right. And when I'm using others, like who's toxic for other people that you care about? Absolutely. So when I'm talking about keep out, I'm talking about personal relationships. I'm not talking larger social groups. Um, I've become more comfortable with creating groups to do things and just that we're, I'm going to do that with that group. And I may, there may not other people that aren't part of that group, but I'm going to do that with that group and that with that group. Um, and I used to spend an entire ton of time feeling bad for people that I hadn't even done anything. <laughs> so, um, uh, having to do a podcast and get things done and get people there, you know, you just kind of get used to the nuts and bolts and the bricks and putting things together. So I became a bit more comfortable. That doesn't mean I still don't stress out about not inviting people, but it is what it is. Anyone else? 2020, good stuff. I mean, I think going back to some of the people who have said is the sort of the bond with the family um, for us going for walks and making meals and eating and having like, meal time together with the wife and the kids and mm -hmm. um, you know when the weather was better we would have meals with my dad and stepmom and my sister and her boyfriend we'd all be socially distanced but be able to go outside and share a meal everybody got into making things um, and I think that was real important and on a sort of superficial note some great tv got released and then being able to share that with others and also stuff that no one else in my family <laughs> wants to watch. Um, you know, yep. Raised by Wolves, uh, The Boys 2, uh, season two was great. Talk with Even Obama gave it a shout out on his top TV of the year. Mm. And, um, you know, there's definitely some good stuff out and able to enjoy some of that, whether Absolutely. you're watching with somebody else or on your own. And podcasting, it is always great. So anytime you can do that. Um, and one of the ones I remember the most is podcasting with Sister K, and I believe you, Zombie Scotty, and uh, this John, Ozzy John. And it was right at the beginning of the pandemic, and we were oh all at different God. points. And my wife worked in global health, so I got these different perspectives. And we talked about the show, but we also talked about all the stuff that was going on yes. and the way that it was getting incorporated, what we thought might happen, and then how things totally changed uh, in Australia just after yes the broadcast and so being able to really appreciate those moments and sink in and maybe that's part of the reason that part of the country was able to pivot this summer on some of the racial issues and really sort of recognize it maybe there was an outlet for it because people like at home and just kept recycling through it and there was nothing else to do and people will say we'll go do this and there were lots of protests and you know, in Seattle um, and throughout the country. Now, obviously, other people had different responses mm -hmm. to it. Um, but I think that was key. And that was some of the things that, like you say, people started to associate more with each other and ideas. And I think that's an important thing that comes out. And like you say, sometimes it's who you're with and who you're not with. <laughs> and Who's not told us? And being more comfortable with that. Yes. So who's not told us the best thing about 2020 yet? Um, Procrastinella, Byron, I. Yeah. Um, you want to go first? Or? Uh, best thing about 2020, uh, made it through it. I mean, like every year, <laughs> you know. And glad to be here, you know. Maybe because I just had a birthday, you know, sentimental. But you know, uh, I think what the old folks say: every day above ground is a good day. So you know, I try and hold on to that and pretty much echo what most of you all said you know uh getting closer with uh family uh a friend a good friend of mine who lives in louisiana we both we, we tend to have a pretty dark sense of humor and you know when everything started happening with covid you know a lot of people were like oh we've got to be inside and we've got a quarantine and you know, when people were up in arms about you know restaurants closing down and mm. theaters and you couldn't go here and go there and so we would kind of look at each other you know virtually and go uh hey that's just another day for us that that's tuesday because you know i i don't go i really didn't go out much when you 
could go out, you know, just like, you know, work, home, grocery store, every now and then, you know, you know, brunch with friends or family. So uh, it wasn't tearing me all up that, oh, God, I, I can't go here. I can't go there. Uh, when it did get, you know, pretty uh, serious, for lack of a better word, I made a point to try and support, you know, local businesses and such. But mm -hmm. You know, um, I still do try and still do, you know, adhere, you know, to the guidelines. I, I will never understand why people will not wear masks. I, uh, but then again, also, I don't understand why people voted for Trump. So, mm. you know, it, it's one of life's great mysteries, but, which is really stupidity. But um, yeah, I got to, you know, spend more time with family and um, like I said earlier, if 2020 has taught me anything is, you know, don't take anything for granted. I mean, none of us, you know, could have seen this, you know, coming down the road, you know, at this time last year, you said, hey, you know, about three, four months from now, everybody's gonna have to stay inside. They can't go there. You're like, oh, who's working on what movie now? That sounds crazy mm -hmm. and then, you know, yet it happened, but it makes you take stock of, you know, like I say, what's important. And I think it makes you more present, you know, mm. focus here. Like Sister Kay was saying, you know, can't, might not be here tomorrow, you know, mm. drinking each second, each day, each moment. And, you know, you basically you know, just do the best you can, you know, and yet you have to hope for, you know, hope for better, you know, I like to think we're on the right track, you know, the main thing, hey, whether or not you want it, Biden as the president, the fact is, we don't have it for president anymore. Yep. So, you know, I'm looking at, you know, trying to look at the big picture, you know, that that's the main thing, since I couldn't get a third term of Obama, you know, hey, but I'm glad that, you know, Trump has gone to me. That's one of, if not the best thing you know, about 2020, mm -hmm. at least we can start trying to start the long and no doubt arduous task of undoing what he has done because he's really, you know, messed stuff up and, you know, hopefully try and make things better, you know, because I think I read somewhere what twice, uh, what was it? twice the majority of white people voted for Trump. And like you said, and you're saying you're a racist, but you're saying what? racism wasn't a deal breaker. And that, that means a lot. That's part of that uncomfortable conversation that yeah. people have to have, you know? And it's like, why? What's so, you know, why did you vote for him? Do you want things to stay the way they are that bad? You don't want this person or that person to have what you have? Why don't you want them to have it? Do you feel they don't deserve it? Or is it just because they come wrapped in a different shade of skin than you do and why do you feel that way that's i think that's the ultimate conversation that america is not ready to have with itself you know excellent byron good thing about 2020 good thing about 2020 so i have loved seeing the new kind of activism coming out of out of this year um, that 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 um makes me happy to see that but uh, so th there's three things that um, I have enjoyed spending time on my own and rediscovering music that mm. I had forgotten about. Like, you know, I've, I've, I've made playlists of all Grace Jones music who I absolutely adored, um, you know, coming up. And I just, you know, having those playlists, um, you know, Grace Jones and, you know, everyone, I, I'm absolutely, I absolutely adore Minnie Riperton. So just going back through her whole, you know, all, all of her, all of her music, um, even when she was with Rotary Connection, even before that, when she was going by different names, you know, but when she worked for, what was it, Chess Records, Stanford uh, in Chicago? Um, I, think I don't was, remember. Yeah, I think it was Chess Records. And I'm also writing the people of Lovecraft Country and telling them they should okay. write into that show. Um, but <laughs> just, yeah, just a whole lot of music, Diana Ross, you know, Bette Midler, just Earl, all their early, early music and just really enjoying that. Um, and I've gotten it, been, I've been able to do that, um, 
you know, being on my own um, with Steve being, I'm actually in Bloomington, Indiana right now, with Steve being here, me being over there, I'm just able to blast this music as much as I want to, you know, this, this old music. And I'm just really loving that. Um, and I have to say, like a lot of you, for me, this being able to embrace myself and being with myself and, and really, you know, understanding my spirit and my soul and how I live, how I can live um, with, with myself um, and really just communing with myself. But another part, and this is going to sound a little, maybe a little odd, but it's also given me the time to kind of commune with my ancestors. Um, you know, I, I, I was a real mama's boy and when my mother died, that just like crushed me. But I've been able to have time with her, I think, and, and have, you know, these conversations. And the way I'm doing that is through my cooking and just going back and thinking about the types of meals that she made. She's from Alabama, from Troy, Alabama. And going back and, and rediscovering the foods that she made and going really going through my memory. And and because I I would sit in the house with my mother when she could to the disdain of my father who wanted me to come out and learn how to change oil. And I was like, uh, can't you pay someone to do that? So I was always in the house with my mother. And I've been able to kind of relive um, those memories by being in the kitchen and just thinking about how would how did she make this, right? And it's been a challenge for me, but I'm getting those recipes and, and they're coming back to me and, and remembering what she did. And for her, that was her creativity. That was her outlet for creativity, right? Because she was this woman who grew up in Alabama, you know, in, in the twenties and thirties and, um, and then traveled around with a crazy Methodist minister who tried to rape her and she had to get away from him and all of this stuff. But just, you know, reliving all her life and, um, and just really communing with her and, and, you know, having those conversations, but also with my father, right? Who I, I don't think I was as close with because of the, you know, he was all into the sports and, you know, I was just like, I just kind of want to be in the house with my mom. So, <laughs> um, which you probably do at an early age was like, there's something different about that boy. But just, you know, communing with both of them and thinking back at everything that, you know, they imparted on all nine of us, right? And their grandchildren while they were still alive. And that, that to me has been very, you know, I've really enjoyed that quite a bit, just having that time to, 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 um, think about them and to think about their parents and their, you know, their, their grandparents and, um, you know, all the things that happened to them in their life and how they brought me to where I am. So that, that, you know, that, that, that's, I think for me has been a beautiful thing of 2020, um, you know, to, and how all that comes into fruition in the work that I want to do in the work that I'm doing also. So yeah, that, that's what I've enjoyed about it. No. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. So that about wraps it up for tonight's episode. Um, dear guests, panelists, dear friends, please tell the audience where they can find you on social media. And we'll start with Procrastinella. Um, I can be found on Twitter at Isn't She Lovely? I S I N S H E L O V E L Y. Excellent. Will. I'm Will. Uh, you can find me at WillWrite64 on Twitter, which I'm not particularly active on. Uh, my podcast is What's, uh, What's Left Media, and uh, What's Left Facebook is a private political Facebook group. If you're interested, let me know. Some people are on it on this, on this panel. Uh, next up. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sister Kay. Uh, you can find us uh, at sisterspeakproductions.com. <clears throat> We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook, Sister Speak Podcast. We have a new YouTube channel. We're putting some of our podcasts there on video. Um, and it's just Sister Speak there. And Instagram, Sister Speak Prod. And we have a private Facebook group called Sister Speak Nation. And I don't know, that's a lot. That's a lot of places. We're everywhere, basically. They're everywhere. Excellent. How about you, Stanford? Well, you can find me. Um, you can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, and also on the, um, the new up-and-coming app Clubhouse, 
Um, you can find me. It's it's the same for all of them. S W Carpenter. Fantastic. How about you, Leandra? You can find me on Twitter at Paris Leandra at P A R R I S Leandra. Okay, and Byron. Um, uh, you can find me at um, on Instagram at Byron Steve, and then on Twitter. Byron B. Craig with no spaces. And then I'm on Facebook also. And you can look for me at um, Illinois State University as well. Excellent. Um, you can find me in the Department of Psychology, Illinois State University webpage. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at dark underscore loops. You can find all Dark Loops podcasts at the Dark Loops Productions channel on YouTube. If you'd like to leave feedback about this podcast, please leave it below on this YouTube page or send a message to darkloopsproductions at gmail.com. So there it is from all of us to all of you, big hugs. And remember, goodbye, goodbye 2020. 2020.